Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Healthcare Tech Inside Show. I'm super excited today to have a friend, Harvard Lilebo, with me. Hi, Harvard. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Thank you. Good to see awesome. you, Nadia. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. For people who don't know Harvard, Harvard is a serial entrepreneur with over 22 years uh, experience in the startup world. He has a couple exits under his belt and over $140 million raised. Crazy, huh? <laughs> I know. I know. I, I've had the honor to serve with Harvard as part of the core team uh, for the uh, Founder Sunday uh, community uh, last year. And I've got to, to know him um, as a hardworking, a true leader who inspires others, who wants to solve big problems. And most importantly, more importantly, do it with the right people. So, Harvard, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was uh, a fun ride uh, together. It was. It was awesome. So, for people who don't know you, Harvard, in your own word, how would you introduce yourself? So, um, I'm a I'm a serial entrepreneur since uh, 22 years. Uh, I have been uh, part of, of uh, developing multiple businesses with all the challenges, the ups and downs that comes mm -hmm. with this, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, profession. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's not a rosy dance. Uh, it is not uh, just uh, good days. It's uh, really hard work over yeah, a long time and uh, the, the difference between success and the failure can be very slim. <laughs> and by the way, failure is only a failure if you fail to learn from it. If you um, don't learn from it, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So tell us the $140 million question. What makes <laughs> a successful CEO who's able to fundraise? What are the top three? Um, characteristics or things that makes or breaks fundraising for startups, especially in tech? So the, my clear number one is trust. You have to be trustworthy. You have to be a partner that people actually want to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, it must be good energy. And yeah. in so, so many of the, the meetings I've had with investors, you as an entrepreneur, you can actually feel the energy is yeah. quite bad from, from uh, early on. And it's so easy for entrepreneurs to think that, well, I just want the money, right? Because mm -hmm. they always want the money. Yeah. But th this is such a key thing to get the right people on board, uh, yeah. the right in type of investors. So um, the, the, the right question is not, can I get the money? The right questions are, these the right people to bring on your journey to work with for maybe 10 plus years are, yeah. are these people you actually really want in your life and for many investors the answer is definitely no mm. i call that the airport test can you be stuck with that person in an airport and still survive that because yeah, well, it's, e it's, even, it's even worse than the airport yeah, because it's kind of like gonna, yeah, 20 years your, together. Exactly. They're going to be on your cap table, <laughs> on your books for ten, five to 10 plus years. So you better make sure that the the synergy is there and that um, fit is there. Yeah. The question then, how do you, how, what do you look for to look for that fit? Are they a good fit? So to me, um, I observe what questions they ask. Mm -hmm. It is actually really, really important. And what, what sort of the tone in the questions? Uh, is, is it a positive, curious yeah. tone? Or is it a sort of fixed mindset type of tone? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you, 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 yeah, you may think that this is sort of about selling, but no, it's not. It's it's about sort of the the relationship. Mm -hmm. It is about uh, do you do you trust these people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and then when you go with, with that attitude into the the meeting, uh, you you kind of you you have a different type of dialogue. 
yes, of course, you have to be enthusiastic and you, you need to be convinced okay. and you need to, to uh, tell a, a great story. But it, it's much more than that. Uh, it is actually, who are these people? Like, if you have a 30-minute meeting and they say nothing, how in the world are you going to, to know who they are? So as an entrepreneur, I think it's, it's very important to also qualify the investors. Mm -hmm. Are they actually someone you want to work with and, and even use time to qualify uh, to, to that they write? Or, or are they sort of flat out? No. And, and I think this is one of the, the things that sort of getting a no from an investor is completely fine. Like yeah, yeah, most it's cases. A data point. Yeah, it's a data point that maybe it's not a good fit. Maybe it's a no for now. Maybe it's not the right timing as well. Yeah, and so for, for me, it's also about sort of are these are, are they understanding the journey I'm mm -hmm. inviting them on? And and if so, and they still say no, well, then it's fine. Like then uh, they're not they're not the right fit or or uh, for for whatever reason and as an entrepreneur i think it's super important to have many 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 alternatives uh, when it comes to sort of which investors are the right ones uh, mm -hmm. and maybe 95% of of them are actually wrong and you need to kind of shift through and and to to meet the 5% that are right so I know many founders are sort of afraid of no's, but you should actually welcome them. So for the, um, sure. My, my, my five-year-old son comes here and he's oh my goodness. To be in bed. And my seven-year-old just came here too. <laughs> and I was me, like, on one you? minute. Uh, yeah. yeah no give me problem. one minute, Nadia, sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, here um, yeah that's part of the journey as an entrepreneur you kind of go with the flow and adjust as you go here on my end I have a half day for the schools and also uh, I have a seven-year-old who's interrupting right now and it's part of the being a founder and an entrepreneur you work with what you have and you adjust accordingly so for all the entrepreneurs thinking out there kudos to you <laughs> sorry about that five-year-olds are not very predictable <laughs> do you hear me yeah, and I, yeah i can hear you and i had a, a seven-year-old interrupting here as well so <laughs> <laughs> that's that's life when you're a founder and a father or mother. You have you have kids. They, exactly. they interrupt you meetings. A lot of things at, at once. So if we go back before you get to qualifying your uh, investors and so on, for the new entrepreneurs out there, where do you start? Where do you find these uh, these uh, potential investors? Whether you are at an angel round or later stages. So typically in the start of any investor process, I ask sort of these questions who, who would be the absolutely best investors to get on board to make this a success and making that list, uh, and sort of figuring out, uh, who are these sort of dream, dream investors, it, it kind of resets many things because, you know, in you may think that these investors are only in the environment around you or they uh, they are only in your country or you know but like if you could actually really pick on the on the well the best ones you want uh, who who would that be and these uh, processes require actually a lot of thinking and research um and once you have that list uh, then you can start to target these uh, these people uh, and, you know, if you never think about who are actually the right type of investors, you will actually never ask the right type of investors. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of a, a victim to your local community or your, your, your 
immediate surrounding or you know uh and and then then you basically get no's from all those you don't dare to ask so i, I think it's important to sort of have a structured um uh, process around this and and also know that this is not a, a a quick fix it's not like you can ask an investor and then they, in the one or two weeks or one month you ha you have the money on account no no <laughs> that's absolutely not how it works and uh in i, I did sort of a review of of uh, my funding processes and i think the average is more like 12 months from i actually kick off these uh, funding processes until you have uh, landed a, a deal and in some cases it's it's even up to two years and in rare cases when the market is is very good uh it may be shorter but but that is clearly the exception so i think sort of you to have someone on your team that has done fundraising multiple times uh and and can sort of guide you in the right way uh because you can't you can't start fundraising when you're out of money for instance like yeah how long or, or if you if you're if you're like you're two weeks out of money uh then you're you're basically you're at a, the, almost the worst position to negotiate yeah any type of deal uh mm -hmm. so which kind of kind of comes back to you need to have very good control of cash yeah uh, so that you yeah, so you know when you're running out of money so that you can actually have a strategy in place and and, and have time to build these relationships uh mm -hmm. so it kind of goes back to the yeah essentials of of uh, managing a business and and having some some sound long-term strategies in place for for raising capital and mm -hmm. when is the best time to raise capital well obviously when you don't need it yeah uh, which so means you don't have to be which means ahead. quite early yeah it means quite early you sh i think most founders should start way earlier than that than they think um and the sort of uh yeah have have this uh yeah, strategy in, in in place for uh for uh, having time to not be in a position where you rush things or you where you get nervous or you know mm -hmm. uh, if you if you get desperate like investors smell that miles away and desperation yeah. is the kind of the worst turn off for for any investor uh, yeah so so how so for let's say a, a founder has like a runway that's how long it's going to take you to get that funding would you say about a year is a, a, a safe bet to given that you've managed your cash flow pretty good but you know exactly how far this is going to take you and you should start initiating those conversations about a year before you run out of money yeah i think uh, sort of one year is is a very good time to start fundraising and you you should never fundraise so you have a, a runway that is less than one year mm -hmm. uh so uh so typically i'm thinking sort of two two years is uh, usually very good mm -hmm. and then you have a uh, one more year to kind of develop the business uh show that you have a uh, good traction yeah. and then you can start fundraise after one year uh, mm -hmm. and you have you have one year to to go before before you actually need the money mm -hmm. uh, so yeah qu quite uh, quite early um it, it can be lower if you have really good results it can be lower but mm -hmm. sort of as a general rule i think sort of one year is is uh, pretty good it's a good it's a good uh, number Tell us about LinkedIn and how you can leverage that to build your network with the strategic network for with the long term in mind when it comes to not only finding the right partner, the right talent, but also as a potential for finding investors. Yeah, LinkedIn is a is a phenomenal tool for funding, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty is that most most investors are actually on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and they're not on Facebook or they're not uh, visible there or they're not on you know Instagram or all these other platforms but most of them actually use quite a lot of time on on LinkedIn so if you uh, connect with interesting people uh, and that can be investors and 
and and you should basically do this uh, as soon as you can if you have some thoughts that maybe someday these could be interesting people for you um well um have a content strategy in place uh, show who you are um share your thoughts and ideas and and kind of build this impression or this reputation uh let let them get to know you without actually never meeting them and this has happened so often with me in the last few years now that i meet investors and they already sort of know me <laughs> yet i never yeah. met them um, and that's the power and... of personal branding and thought leadership on linkedin so it's oh, indeed chasing you become a magnet you attract the right people and repel the wrong ones as well and the beauty is that you have this opportunity to create a first impression so if you if you create quality content and people think well that was thoughtful you know or uh huh interesting uh, you, you you have this sort of first impression that you can sort of completely curate yeah um and that can be your linkedin profile it can be your 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 content or mm -hmm. comments or there there's so many ways that you can sort of be, end up on the radar on of some of yeah. these investors and and for investors also uh, I, I would say probably 80 percent never share never interact they don't but they, read, but they but they, but they read. read yeah they, they read do. that 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 is the beauty mm -hmm. uh so so impressions means nothing um having the right audience means everything mm -hmm. um and and, uh, and of course having quality content yeah and for the audience here, Harvard is one of the top voices on LinkedIn through his leadership and uh, thought leadership content around. Oh, which was a complete surprise. <laughs> complete no, surprise you, to me, you actually. You have really good content, Harvard. You, you, you really, <laughs> and you are a community builder as well. So can you comment on how important is community building? for entrepreneurs as you are growing as you're going through your journey uh founder's mm. journey i think many many founders are not situated in silicon valley or in london or these uh, sort of super hub spots for for founders and when you're a founder you're, you're kind of a standout in the community in your local community and for me it's there no one around me here and that that is doing the kind of crazy things i'm doing so luckily i find sort of like-minded people through linkedin and it shows that there are actually many people who who like this craziness so i think sort of linkedin is especially important when you're outside of these super hubs mm -hmm. uh and and then you can get help from these founders and you can get inspired by them and they can give you introductions to investors they can they can help you uh, refer people there, there are so yeah. many positive sides of this mm -hmm. um and uh, what we did with uh, this uh, founder sunday i thought was actually quite uh, yeah quite remarkable it was um, it is. yeah it was a remarkable get, getting people together and and it was an experiment uh, with sort of no business intent or mm -hmm. but just sort of trying to get good people come together and and yeah. uh, build network and as a result of this i think we we connected like thousands of founders or potential founders uh, absolutely and, i met and, outstanding people like and and me too like really a lot of good people <laughs> yeah yeah it is because the um i think the essence of it was by founders for founders there was no selling yep. It's if yep. you need help, if you have questions, if you need, you know, introductions or so, there wasn't, you know, any motives uh, behind mm. it, which made it very mm. special. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and for many of these other, other groups, you, you, you see this, uh, that there is like a hidden selling China. motive or they want you to, you to link up to a course or they want your money so, somehow. And yeah, somehow they was... are part of a funnel. So whether yeah. you are at the yeah. top of the middle yeah. or the bottom of yeah. the funnel to lead to some sort of business, which wasn't yeah. the case uh, for yeah. the Founder Sunday. So that was a super special community for sure. And that's where we met uh, you and me. And yeah. so 
let's say you've done, you've met, you've built your network, you've positioned yourself through your, you know, thought leadership or personal branding and so on on LinkedIn, and you attracted, you know, people started contacting you, contacting you. And you mentioned do your due diligence on these investors too. What does that entail, the due, the due uh, diligence part? Now, for me, it's first and foremost, actually, sort of the energy. Like, do, do, do I meet people with the right type of energy? Um, people that I would love to work together with because they ask good questions, they're curious. They they want to they have they they sort of sign on to the the vision or they have a, a vision a shared vision mm -hmm. and and uh, imagine sort of having investors that every day you you meet them they they uh, they go like this why haven't you done this <laughs> or you know that is stupid and mm -hmm. it's like do you want a life like that I definitely don't like it's not like I, I like I, I make many mistakes um, I, I don't. I don't usually make them on purpose, <laughs> but uh, you know, you, you always try your best. Uh, but if you, if you kind of have that mentality and you have to kind of defend everything and, and, and yeah, just get sort of into a very negative spiral. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but when you surround yourself with people with, with the right attitudes, the, the mm -hmm. same shared vision, uh, things just flow so much easier. And everyone knows that the, well, there, there is risk in what you do, and we're actually trying to do something big and and mm -hmm. and uh, audacious, you know. And it's and and it co it comes with risk, but there is no sort of finger pointing or sort of drama or conspiring or you know. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to experience those people to understand how bad it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the journey is hard itself, especially if you're you know, trying to solve a big problem that hasn't been done before. So the risk yeah. is much higher. The challenges are likely to be much higher. And failure is not a failure if you don't learn from it. Failure is part of the journey. And a Absolutely. lot of entrepreneurs, they are, the failure part is the one thing that can hold them back. How do you deal with that in relationship to, you know, keeping your investors up to date and so on? one word or two actually full transparent full transparency mm -hmm. and that's the only way when it goes good or if it's bad uh, you have to be transparent <laughs> and and of course you can manage it when bad things happen you can have like your plans how to to mitigate yeah. or or stuff but you you, mm -hmm. you you cannot start to think that you should conceal something i see like then then you're completely on the wrong track <laughs> Uh, and it goes back to this trust that you have and to that's build. Where, yeah, I was thinking it loops back to that trust factor. Yeah. And and like when, when I uh, there is also sort of a uh, like when I, I when I get excited about the business, I want to speak with the best people in the world mm -hmm. because then you get access to a wealth of knowledge, mm -hmm. and they can tell you immediately if this is uh, something uh, wrong in your assumptions or. Or if it's completely stupid, uh, what you're thinking, or they can validate things in 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 a very very effective way. I see. Whereas if you if you don't dare to talk to extremely competent people, mm -hmm. you may be uh, sort of lured into thinking that well this is actually great when it's not. Uh, so kind of expose yourself to really good people, and that is like the best way to to actually also figure out what are the right assumptions what what yeah. are the risks how to how to handle this mm -hmm. and uh, and it's just sort of a little different way to think that m many think that well it's a failure if this ex expert says i'm i'm wrong yeah. but no it's not it's it's actually really good because then you'll learn something data point that helps you yeah. pivot without wasting your time exactly and yeah. and if the, the if real experts and, and i'm not just saying sort of one or or, or two but if if many real experts say that uh, sorry this is uh, this is stupidity over well mm -hmm. then you kind of recalibrate your mindset and it's like or or your data points and and say that uh, hmm maybe the, maybe this has to be done in a different way yeah, yeah whereas if you if you never dare to make that sort of failure 
mm-hmm. then then um, then you don't get these uh, these learnings. Yeah, it um, reminds me uh, of that quote that being surrounded by people smarter than you is a blessing. Oh, because indeed. it's yes. gonna save you. And that takes me to my next question. A lot of people think investors is about money. I think it's way more than that. Where does the knowledge and the experience come into into play for the uh, the investors you pick to work with? Assuming that there is the energy, there is you know the you get along, but how important is it that on top of the money they can bring either expertise or even access to that network if you need to raise more? You know, two three years down the line. I think this is a many founders make big mistakes on there because I think it's just about the money. But as as I kind of started with, it's all about a relationship. And mm-hmm. once you invite people and they invest a million euros or or so, mm-hmm. they will have a big saying in yeah. uh, early early stage startup. Mm-hmm. And if they are setting the agenda or they're part of the board. Or you have to report this or that. Uh, it it it's definitely not money. Uh, it's money and always a relationship. Yeah. So that's why I think the sort of energy level and and uh, sort of <laughs> you you wanting to actually work with these and you mm-hmm. uh, admiring them and and to your point, sort of, uh, I always try to get investors that I I, I admire and I, I want to work with and that I respect and that I think can contribute actively to, to the success of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, surround yourself with uh, with uh, much better people. Um, that, that should really be your philosophy. If you, uh, yeah. if you want to build a successful company, I think uh, the, the first recruits, uh, f- four or five uh, recruits you, you make are, are extremely important um, because that kind of sets the culture for the, the company for uh, how you do things, uh, what, what kind of people you attract. And if you make only one sort of rotten hire, uh, yeah. you, you, you have, well, uh, until you experience how bad it, it can be, uh, mm-hmm. you don't realize how bad it can be. <laughs> it can get much worse, much worse than you, uh, than you, you may think uh, because all of, all of the sort of negative consequences and yeah, and bad energy that comes from from these wrong yeah. hires. Yeah, they always say hire slow and fire fast. So take your time to get the right the right hire, especially early on, because the team is small enough. The impact of it can be multiplied uh, magnitude, orders Indeed. of magnitude. Let's say you found the right investors and so on. You need to pitch to them. How do you go about pitching? So I think it starts long time before the the pitch actually, mm-hmm. uh, and it starts with convincing yourself that what you're doing is really worth it, and that means qualifying all your key assumptions. It mean means finding the right business model, the right fundament, uh, and you know understanding competition. All these sort of key areas that investors are care about uh, but -hmm. you don't do it actually for for the investors you you do it for yourself so to figure out that is this actually worth my time and energy should should i be doing this and when you have that sort of process before a pitch um and you you collect these data points you 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 validate the key assumptions you get the positive feedback from problem interviews with yeah with customers you 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 really understand the problem at the depth um mm-hmm. and you have a sort of you 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 figure out that you actually have a, a very unique solution yeah you you can bring that confidence into that first investor meeting it is so uh, true i've experienced that myself you can tell if somebody has taken the time to understand the problem i'm actually a big proponent of problem first design thinking. So it's not the solution and then you try to go find a a problem to solve. It's the other way around. 
And the mistake that I see quite a bit is a lot of startups, they don't take time to do those customer interviews. Go talk to people. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Validate your assumptions. And some of them would be wrong and you have to pivot and it's okay. It's better now than like, you know, a year from now after you raise money and you waste it on the wrong thing. Yeah, and, and not only some will be wrong, some of your key assumptions are always wrong. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that you're so biased that you don't see them. Because so you're so they, yeah. And, and, and it can be biased because you're a tech geek or it can be biased because uh, you don't understand the technology. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are main assumptions that always are wrong. Mm -hmm. And your job as an entrepreneur is to figure out which assumptions are key and to validate as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is that this can actually be done very fast, mm -hmm. very fast. But if you don't focus on it, you, you, you end up spending years of your life wasting things on, on uh, the wrong assumptions. And just to kind of have a, a sort of personal you experience on this example? that I can share. Yeah, I was going to share, ask, do you have an example? Yeah, so uh, when I was uh, when I was uh, 22 years old, um, mm -hmm. after my uh, my master of business and uh, economics, uh, I told you wrote MBA. It's not technically an MBA. It's a master of business and economics, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was doing my first business plan. Uh, I was uh, for three months. I was sitting down and creating like a 60, 70 page document about uh, my first business. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a yeah, it was a lot of work. Uh, you had to think through sort of you know all these uh, different yeah. elements, um, and and then uh, sort of I was quite happy about this, you know, and uh, I thought that this was required for for getting investors, and then I kind of made this huge mistake that I actually didn't qualify my assumptions, mm. uh, and. When you make three months effort into a business plan and one of your key assumptions are wrong, you actually waste those three months completely. Yeah. Like, yeah, yes, of course, you can learn from uh, from this as a failure. <laughs> so it's not like wasted in, in that sense. And for me, it was actually an invaluable lesson. Um, but uh, some of my key assumptions were wrong and I didn't know and I didn't see that. So I based sort of the business plan on these uh, wrong assumptions. And mm -hmm. I just realized that oh, how, what a waste this was. Yeah. And I could actually have, have uh, easily checked these key assumptions, which could be sort of willingness to pay. It could be yeah. sort of the, on, on the technology side. It can be market uh, size. It can be sort of even what, what is your, your, your beachhead market? Uh, yeah. And, and, and these are so critical things to, to understand. And there is no sort of definitive answer that this is better than this. But if you don't do the analysis or you, if you don't think yeah. about sort of there, there may be five different ways to, to model this business. You, you, mm -hmm. you, you lock yourself into one option and then you think that this is the yeah. only way. And you, you, you don't see the sort of all the possibilities. Yeah. Like, should yeah. you, should you sell a, sell a product? Should you, should you rent it? Mm -hmm. uh, it should, yeah, should it be a service? Mm -hmm. um, there, there, there are so many ways to, to actually make a business. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a kind of very fundamental that the, sort of the business modeling is done right. And this is why you need, you need to talk to, to customers. Uh, to, uh, and to, and ve very early on, you need to qualify those customer assumptions. And I think this is where most people get it wrong, actually. Yeah. They, they think yeah. they understand the problem, but they don't. Yeah, one example that comes to mind is uh, for for the uh, the audience listening to this. Think of the gorilla the, the gorilla example. You're so yeah. close to your technology that you're developing. There is this um, video. You, know, you can check it out on YouTube, where they ask people to count how many passes between teams that have a white shirt and a black shirt. And everybody was so focused on that. And then they put a mascot in a gorilla suit, walk through the, the whole group, and they even changed the curtains in the back. And then they asked the group, how many did notice the gorilla in the room? 
over, I think, 40% didn't see the gorilla. So think about that in terms of if we relate that to your assumptions of your startup, you're so close focusing on that, getting that solution that you may yep. miss the gorilla in the room. Talking to your not only end users, by talking to your customers, it's more like stakeholders who can make the ecosystem map. It could be the influencer, the end user, the decision maker, even the saboteurs who could be, you know, lose business from your solution and can hinder your go-to market. The more you understand this, the better off you are into crafting the right value proposition, not only to raise money, but to make your product to market. Yeah, and I didn't see that gorilla when I saw that video. So I'm uh, I'm one of those that oh. has a blind. <laughs> so you, no, know, I, you I, know that video, I, yeah. I completely did not see the gorilla. So and I was the like, there is a there was a gorilla. I did not <laughs> notice. So yeah, and, so and this is it, it comes really uh, to to a personal level and just mm -hmm. realizing that your assumptions are actually wrong makes you much more humble. That uh, okay, I'm one of those. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I did, this is this is a trap for me. If I if mm -hmm. I don't um, if I'm not aware of this, I will actually go right into that trap. And I've mm -hmm. done that many times in 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 my startups. Uh, yeah. But uh, now I I know uh, there's a much better way and a much more efficient way where I don't waste my time because yeah. of, uh, of of these uh, blind spots. Yeah. And uh, there was one more thing I was thinking about, sort of um, when you said sort of stakeholders and. And uh, of course, sort of going into an investor meeting to to pitch, um, uh, this is not sort of typically my my, my style. Uh, I, I want to go into investor meetings to to figure out if they're the right partners. Mm -hmm. I like to share my vision and sort of what this could be. Um, but um, also, as I said, I pay very close attention to what questions they ask. I see. Uh, because because the questions. <laughs> I, and I learned this actually from very early uh, when I was uh, doing Innotech Solar back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I was I, I was able to, I, I was thinking to myself, how do I know that this is actually worth it? Mm -hmm. And my, my thinking was that, well, if I can meet with the, uh, this investor, which was uh, like the, the most respected investor in Scandinavia, Northern Ventures, if I can meet with them, I get access to 15, 20 years of hard experience from successes and failures. And in, in that, uh, it was only a 15 minutes meeting. Uh, what are the key, the first questions that actually come to mind when they hear my, my, my story? And do I, do I actually have good enough answers to to those questions like imagine that you you're you're drawing upon like 20 years of experience mm -hmm. and that first or second question that comes is is kind of rooted in all that experience um so i, I think it's 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 very important to be focused on what questions are they actually asking because it tells a whole lot about them and if they are the right type of investors and if they have something to add to your your case, if they have the right background, uh, or or uh, but also sort of course how you should pitch because maybe they are knowledgeable, maybe they they they're not. So so you, you need to also of course also qualify them uh, during that uh, that first sort of meeting. But it's never now with me. It's it's never with a pitch deck. I, I never pitch with a pitch deck. Because it's, it's about, about the relationship. Sharing the vision, sharing the story. Is there alignment in yep. with the with that vision and energy? Yeah, and, and of course you need a pitch deck, uh, so, uh, so that you can uh, you can share. Um, maybe sometimes to get the meeting, uh, they need to understand that that uh, well, this is uh, this is worthy of of my time. Mm -hmm. And there's one sort of a, a kind of a epiphany uh, uh, about pitch decks and. It's like yeah. how, how much time how much time do investors actually spend on pitch decks? I would Most say minimal amount. Well, uh, but but uh, founders when they make pitch decks, most Pretty pitch second? decks are for uh, <laughs> most pitch decks are for I would say ten to fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. 
uh, with a lot of text, you know, a lot of stuff. Yeah. And from my own experience, the average time spent on on my pitch decks are probably 90 seconds. I was thinking about one to two minutes. Yeah, one to two minutes is, is a sort of a fair range. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And once you understand that, you actually create different pitch decks than before. No, yeah, because if you, if, you, if, you, yeah, if you try to, to make something for 15 minutes and mm -hmm. world-class investors spend 60 to 90 seconds, you will lose them. You will definitely yeah. lose them yeah. because you're not talking their language. You don't understand them. Yeah. Uh, so it, it kind of goes back into how do you create something that is it's kind of like writing a LinkedIn post. How do you hook their attention? Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, do, you, do you engage them, make them curious? Uh, and how do you deliver it's something that is meaningful? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so, which is another way I think uh, sort of writing on LinkedIn is, is, a, is a very good experience for founders. Mm -hmm. I think content creation and building your brand overall is a huge experience for founders because you hone in you put in the reps in yep. low risk environment so when you are Indeed. in a high risk situation you can pitch for within 30 seconds within a minute and you can learn how to read the room also this way you can gain feedback from the people you're talking to are they because most communication is in body language Oh, it's absolutely. not in the words. It's in like I, I, I was in I was in a meeting today, uh, Nadia, and mm -hmm. uh, like uh, this was uh, for uh, 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 someone else was making the pitch, and mm -hmm. when when you pitch, it's, it's usually quite hard, uh, especially over type of Teams or Zoom. It's quite hard to to both speak and kind of read the room, as you say. Uh, yeah. Because you you, yeah. you 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 know you have to tell the story and and stuff and yeah. and uh, my my focus is like on on uh, on the on the people on the other side. How do they react? Are they smiling? Are they engaging? You know, uh, they like I, 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 yeah yeah yeah. So 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 you 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 get so much information from reading the room. Yeah. But it's, it's as I said, it's, it's quite hard to do that when you you sort of tell a story, because you, you, at least for my mind, I, I can't sort of do two things uh, very well at the same time. <laughs> and that's the power um, of storytelling, because a lot of technical founders they think it's about the tech, it's about it's about the story that is memorable for the person who's listening to it. Then yeah. think of. I think of these investor meeting almost like a first date. Would you ask the person to marry you on the first date? Probably not. So it's more you see if there is that synergy, you see if there is, you know, that alignment. Are they, as you mentioned, are they potentially the right partner? And the key is to get that next meeting. If they need, if they're not technical, like on the technical side, chances are they have a due diligence team or subject matter experts. You will get your chance to get technical and nerdy, but probably not in the first <clears throat> investor uh, meetings. So what's your take on that? And how do you go about this? Yeah, it's, it, of course, technology is, is very important as a fundament, but mm -hmm. it's never a tech pitch. It's never a tech story. It's mm -hmm. how, what can you use this for? Uh, mm -hmm. And and I remember uh, some uh, some investors actually said this to me that, like, how are you working with very advanced technologies yet? You 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 actually don't speak about technology. You mm -hmm. you, you speak about sort of what this can be or the, the the vision or you know the business side. And I think that that is kind of the the, the key thing, at least in the first meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. Why should they care? Well, they will never care about bits and uh, dots, or uh, you know, this. They, they, they care about cr creating something meaningful that can create value for customers, where there is uh, likelihood that they can actually get, uh, yeah, the, the a, a, a good business. Yeah. Um, and are you the right 
person to lead that business? Are you that they're vetting you as a person? Do they do they believe in you? So all these other things are going on while most founders are thinking that uh, this is about sort of delivering a perfect technically speaking pitch. No, mm -hmm. no, it's not. <laughs> it's it's relationships. It's bringing them on board to believe in your vision and that you you as a founder are the one who can lead that and your team is the one yeah. who can make it happen. So yeah. now let's say you found the right partners and so on. You need to maintain that, you know, relationship. Any tips on how to maintain, you know, good relationships with uh, investors that are likely on your books or with uh, along with your journey for years? Yeah, keep them informed, be, be transparent, um, uh, engage them. Um, don't uh, hide anything. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, be, be sort of, a, be, a, be a good person. Um, and uh, don't start with these, uh, these uh, sort of games or, or trying to be smart or, or stuff. Be be authentic. Be uh, be easy to to deal with. Uh, and and sometimes, of course, even if you think they're good persons, it may it may turn out after you work together for quite some time that uh, maybe it's not actually the right uh, right match. Um, so so even if you try to sort of vet and and uh, work with uh, with these people, um, there there may be sort of differences that that occur and. Sometimes it, it works, sometimes it, it doesn't. And, and that's also part of the game. You, you can never vet 100% uh, and be completely sure that these things are going to work out for the long term, as is the case in dating, uh, as is in the case of marriage. You know, it's a similar thing. Uh, it's just that in, you know, for most people, uh, they, uh, they, uh, it's, it's easy to <laughs> quit a marriage and, and, uh, I'm married for 22, uh, for not even 22, for uh, since 2004. So it's actually 20 years this year. And some some uh, relationships are worth uh, keeping. And what is your ecosystem that you design around you with the right type of voices mm -hmm. uh, that you want to have in your life? And some people you want to definitely to have there, and others, nah, maybe maybe not so much. And some definitely not. <laughs> uh so i think i think we, we we should be very i i'm very deliberate about sort of what type of voices do i want in my life because i have a lot of good people there and it's like adding another person or or uh, well it, it it comes with uh, with some yeah great care um because i want those voices also to be great and you everyone knows what it means when you get these bad voices into your life Oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah, drama, it's conflict, it's, ah, you know, yeah. the energy is killing you. I'm a strong believer in protecting our energy. A lot of people, they they talk about time management and so on. It's more about energy management. Once you align your energy with your goals, with the right people, at the right frequency, who are at the right frequency, in the yeah. right stages to where you want yeah. to be, you can have an amplifying effect, not only for you, but for your team and for your uh, uh, business. This has been the yeah. shortest hour, uh, Harvard. I can't believe it's almost one o'clock, uh, one hour. Oh, it is. Already. <laughs> already. <laughs> well, we know that fundraising, especially in the past two years, has been a little tougher. Uh, any yeah. advice for uh, founders out there um, how to fundraise in this funding environment? Yeah. Don't care about uh, whether people say it's tough or not. Go do the work. Uh, mm -hmm. It's I've been fundraising now since 22 years. Mm -hmm. It's in super tough times. It's in good times. Sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes the the environment is is not so good. But investors are always eager to invest into good uh, good projects with good people. Mm -hmm. Good people will always find investor for their uh, for their projects it may take some uh, a longer time and that is exactly why you should start early with this sort of 12 months 
uh, mm -hmm. because you you can't control if things are going quick or or not. Yeah. But you need to have the 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 run weight so that it can actually take time. Uh, so now, actually, just in the last few weeks, um, it seems to be it seems to be getting easier. Mm -hmm. uh, like the 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 mood is uh, it it seems like it's shifting uh, positively. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, there are some some uh, yeah good signs in on. Uh, that I see, and that uh, the, the 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 sort of the last years have been mm -hmm. uh, more more tough. But I raise a lot of capital also in the tough times, so so it, it's possible. Uh, so don't don't let don't let your uh, like don't read the news that things are are just difficult and, and accept it. Uh, mm -hmm. Just go go do the work, and it, it is possible. Awesome. I had a question that was pre-submitted. Uh, it says, here we go, hold on. What are the pitfalls that you've observed founders fall into when fundraising and how can they avoid them? That's part A. And part B, what are the red flags that a new founder to fundraising should be looking out for and avoiding? Well, I think we have covered sort of a lot of these uh, red flags uh, when it comes to sort of investors and and uh, sort of finding the right uh, type, uh, someone you want to work with, someone you admire uh, to start uh, with. Uh, yeah, when you have good good time and a good runway, and and sort of have respect uh, for uh, that these processes may actually take quite some time. Um, Desperate founders is a completely a red flag for any investor. Uh, so, so don't be be one of those, which means you need to fund early so that you have a, you you don't get into that desperation mode. Um, the the first question you said was uh, sorry, and I talked too much on the other. <laughs> the first question was the first question: What are the most pitfalls that founders fall into when fundraising, and how can they avoid them? I think most of the, the pitfalls are you you haven't convinced yourself. You haven't checked the, the key assumptions. And when you're not convinced, then it's extremely hard to convince others. Mm -hmm. So so this is sort of the basic. Do do the fundamental work first. Understand the problem at at depth. Yeah. See that there, there are multiple ways to, to sort of get a business out of this and, and explore those multiple alternatives mm -hmm. um, and figure out what, what is actually the better way. And pivoting in, in startups is a very usual thing. Uh, and they do that because they, they understand things better. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but pivots are, well, it's good because then you kind of survive. But some of these pivots are actually able, you're, you should be able to see this at a very early stage, if you do your homework, um, so so basically do do a sort of fundamental analysis and, and homework, convince yourself, and and I think that that is a that is my sort of way. That that's when I get super excited about some things, I can convey that enthusiasm to to anyone, and and some it radiates with, and you you sort of you 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 find interest, and they want to join on that journey. Others don't see it, and which is completely fine, but. I think that that enthusiasm is, is very very important uh, for well for me and and hopefully for for other founders as well. That's great. So kind of... That is awesome, Harvard. Before we wrap it up, what would be your top three advice for founders who are starting their fundraising journey from your twenty two plus years experience? If you're new to and and you haven't raised equity from professional investors, uh, go find some uh, find a teammate uh, or find someone that can help you, because it takes a long time to actually learn this to to fundraise in in, in a good way. Uh, and there are so many difficulties in in uh, in fundraising and sort of setting. Yeah, f finding this investor partner that I, I think it's if I were 22 again, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, 
appreciate sort of having someone with with much more experience on the team that could help me avoid some of the mistakes I made. And those people are are there around you. So sort of find those mentors to 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 yeah get you up that learning curve uh, much faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, use uh, start fundraising one year before you need. I think is a good one. And yeah. uh, number three, make sure that you bring the right people along on your journey. That well, is these awesome. are these, these are there's a lot of wisdom in these three. <laughs> that, is, that is like 22 years packed into three, three uh, top priorities. I really appreciate you taking time in the middle of your evening, family time to be with us here. And uh, it's been a pleasure. So good to uh, to be on stage with you again. And I will uh, see you around on LinkedIn. Thank you, Nadia. It was uh, good to uh, to talk to you, and uh, I hope uh, some people can find this uh, useful. And it's my raw experiences, so uh, reach I'm out sure, on LinkedIn if, sure. uh, if if people yes, want also. If you, yeah, if you need uh, to um, touch base with uh, Howard, you can find him on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, any other, um, you know, uh, call to action as we say in business uh, for the audience uh, for you. No ask, I th- and then that is that was the beauty of Founder Sunday. That is still the beauty, I think. There is That's no awesome. ask. And giving works, <laughs> giving works. And if you'd like to uh, be in touch with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Or if you want to see the replay for these interviews, they are on my YouTube channel at uh, Dr. Nadia Butawi. And with that, I will see you next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.